Hello, today on my channel you will hear an amazing story about life. I hope you enjoy this story. This one struck me to the core. Honestly, I still can't forget it. Enjoy watching. Well, whispered Mike, a hardened thief and con man. Pete didn't answer. He was working on the locks, and in the judge's house, they're complicated, fancy, expensive, protected against everything, sawing, ripping, breaking, automatic locking in case of attempted unauthorized access. In general, with all the tricks that marketers invented for rich people to feel safe. Bingo, Pete whispered, opening the last mechanism. He pulled the handle slowly, carefully, and the door opened. Although the house was dark and the hallway was lit only by the moon, the luxury was noticeable even in the semi-darkness. Wood-paneled floors and walls, huge mirrors, expensive furniture, bronze and plaster figures. A wide staircase to the second floor, handrails decorated with balusters, moldings on the ceiling, a glass chandelier, and other attributes of success and prosperity. Mike felt the pleasant tingle that always came to him on the case. It was as if he were going through shells on the seashore, and in one of them, he suddenly discovered a huge pearl. Joy, the anticipation of profit filled his black soul, but there was another feeling too, the sweet revenge he was about to exact. Pete and Mike stopped, listening. Was the alarm going off? Was the owner preparing to meet them with a shotgun? And wasn't there a huge dog that could chew their asses off? No, everything was quiet and peaceful. The expensive appliances didn't make any noise. It was November, so the air conditioners were off, too. Mike pointed to the stairs, and they pulled out their volleys. That's what the thugs called all kinds of firearms, whether they were pistols, sawed-off shotguns, or small rifles. They took what they could get, Mike an old colt, and Pete a fresh Glock, which he had been lucky enough to get from an acquaintance. Mike led the way. It's only in the movies that the leader leads his gang. In the real world, the leader prefers to hide behind the backs of the fighters. There was only one, but it was better than nothing. Yeah, people live, Pete thought, pacing the second floor. They knew how to live. It won't be long now. There were pictures on the walls, gauges, shelves of awards from the judge, his wife, and their daughters. Pete wanted to turn on the light to get a better look at all this good stuff. Something he could take away as a souvenir. No, I don't think so. It's all about the cash. I don't think that man in the row trusts banks. He must keep all his money, earned by honest and dishonest labor, in a safe. Yes, the cleaning lady had told him everything and even took pictures, so he already had a detailed floor plan in his head. Where the judge's bedroom was in the house, where the safe was and that there would be no strangers in the house today, November 11th. Herbert had sent his family to a sale in the city, rented a hotel for a few days, but he stayed in the cottage to get away from his annoying wife and melancholy daughter. Perhaps he read cases on weekends or wrote new sentences. Too bad the girl won't be here, Mike thought. I'd be with her. Ah, he had no luck with women. He'd gotten his first sentence at 16 as a kid, if you ask me. And since then, in between sentences, he hadn't had time to meet enough normal girls to have a healthy relationship. Or they avoided him. Mike's lot in life were corrupt women who came into his life easily and left it just as quickly. Pete pointed the barrel at a large mahogany door. Mike turned the knob slowly with his left hand, listened, asleep, judge, feeling safe. Behind all the expensive locks and electronic gadgets, pulled the door open. Everything else went according to plan. Pete jumped abruptly into the room and flicked on the light. The light switch, Barbara said in her annoying voice, is to the right of the entrance. Mike ran up to the judge and struck him on the forehead with the handle of his pistol. Herbert had by now opened his eyes from behind the light, but was immediately plunged into darkness. He had not even had time to realize what had happened. Just now he had been watching his dark judicial dreams, and here it was as if they had come true. Stunned, 
He could hear his tormentors talking, but he couldn't tell if he was dreaming or real. There's the safe, Mike chuckled. Look at that. Yeah, Pete exhaled. It's easy to open one of these. Is there any hot food? Mike asked. I want to wet my throat, but I can't. I'll wet your throat. Pete threatened him. He didn't drink much alcohol himself and couldn't stand it if someone started drinking alcohol on the job. All right, all right, boss. I was just asking. It's a special day after all. I could use a drink. The robbers covered the windows. Two of them lifted the judge up, put him in a chair, tied his hands and feet. Pete looked closely at the face of the justice of the peace. Not young already wrinkles, gray hair. In the court session, he looked formidable and even convincing. And he seemed 10 centimeters taller. Silk pajamas, of Pete thought. A real man should sleep in his mother's clothes, next to some hottie. The thug calculated the force of the blow precisely. He called it a cleaver. It should hit the parietal region from above, without much fanaticism. The lights would go out for about 20 minutes. He struck carefully, almost jewel-like. After all, the judge should live at least a little longer for an hour or two, until they get bored. Slowly, leisurely, they began to look through the rooms. Anything of value was brought into the judge's bedroom and left on the bed. Rolex watches, men's and women's. A gold chain of 30 centimeters, no less. Cash, pennies, two or three thousand dollars, but it's okay. The statuette was not cheap. Mike had brought it. Pete took it and put it on the shelf. It's notable, he explained. Let's have another look. In the judge's office and at the judge's home, he saw her black pen. There was a rumor about her in prison. Hera's the only one who signs sentences. He puts his fat little handwriting, like, to make it clear who's boss. Legend's right. I'd take her, but she's too conspicuous. It'll turn up. I decided to keep it. The judge groaned and raised his head. Mike punched him in the eyebrow and immediately split it. A few red drops fell on his black silk pajamas. Pete stopped his accomplice from waving his fists around. They still needed that judge. He was slowly coming to his senses. He blinked his eyes and tried to focus on them. Finally, the cleaver stopped working and Herbert's consciousness cleared. Did you recognize him? Pete asked with a grin. Of course, replied the judge. Surprisingly, his voice was calm. Pete even thought he was smirking, and it made him want to split his other eyebrow. But he held back. Do you know who you put in jail? Pete said menacingly. Oh, exhaled the judge. Specify the month, or at least the year. I've imprisoned so many. He was about to say fallen, but stopped himself. Don't piss these criminals off. Breaking into a judge's house, that's taboo in the criminal world. Outlaws, thought Herbert, but for some reason he remained calm, though his hands were trembling. I don't think they'll notice. You know everything, Pete smiled. You're a clever boy. After the fear experienced at the beginning, the ringleader had already gained complete control of himself. During the trial, the judge was a king and a god, but now he was pathetic. Now he only had to pretend that everything was under control, that now the cops would jump out of the sky and save him. In reality, none of that would happen. Now, tonight, he and Mike are judges, and that justice of the peace is going to be in trouble. All right, Herbert shrugged. I recognize you. I recognize you. Did you recognize me? Did you guess what we're going to do to you? Mike grinned. He had ghastly black teeth, a horror for a dentist. Of course, replied the judge. If you've come without masks, you'll kill me. Otherwise, I'll recognize you. What a clever boy. Pete splashed his hands together. We'll kill you at the end. And first, we'll torture you. We'll torture you. We'll remember everything about you, every sentence you've been sentenced to. Oh, it's gonna be long, I promise. The judge sighed. Whether he was naturally so calm or whether he was able to hide his emotions skillfully, most likely, 
the second he should not show his attitude to what is happening. But this detachment of Herbert's was beginning to get on Pete's nerves. No, we've got to break that bastard. Aren't you going to say anything? He asked. We'll torture him, I said. You don't even know how to live. You ain't never been beaten or tortured by the cops, like me or Mike. No torture, the judge admitted. I'll tell you one thing before you guys get in trouble. If you untie my hands right now and give me the phone, I'll have you tried for attempted robbery only. And if you kill me, you won't live to see trial. And you know that better than I do. Everything that happened before was just a warm-up. No one will forgive you for killing a judge. Pete's shivering. He's suddenly cold. The judge is right. Of course, they'll do a clean job. They won't leave any evidence. But still, the cops will dig their hooves into the ground. And if they get lucky, no, that can't be. It just can't. We got to open the safe, get the cash, take out the judge, and then we're out of here. Except burn the house down, but that's for later. You know the Hill District, the judge continued, as if noticing Pete's confusion. There's a camera on every pole. You guys are on the radar. You guys are notorious. You shit where you live. The bastard touched the statue and left marks on it. You'll be easy to find, my good men. At those words, the judge smiled as if he'd taken the initiative. Or maybe he's a real badass and he's not afraid of anything. Pete looked over at Mike and he lowered his head. Did he really touch him? Is it true? Pete asked his partner in crime. No big deal, Mike replied, taking the statue and rubbing it on his clothes. The leader swore, grabbed the trinket, and threw it at the wall. It shattered into tiny pieces. Well, Pete asked, how long will forensics look for this ash hole cells in the shards? Okay, shrugged the judge, but they'll find you anyway. So the only option is to untie me and give me a phone. I'll put in a good word so you can sit there like kings. You'll be out on parole in five years. I can really do that. That's when Mike laughed. How many times had the cops promised him that for a clean confession? And how many times had they cheated him? Pete suddenly calmed down too. No, they won't screw up. They'll burn the house down and all traces of it with it. They'll go away, lay low. And when they find it, they'll say no. Cops aren't stupid either. No evidence, no case. And it's not like they're gonna jump out of their skin for this judge. Let's cut to the chase, Pete said. That's a safe behind your back. I can certainly open it with a hammer and chisel. Unto your hands, the judge asked. I'll open it. Well, no, said Mike and moved in close to the prisoner. His stinking breath made Herbert cringe. Tell me where the key is. There is no key. It opens by fingerprint, the judge replied and bit his lip. I wish those scumbags hadn't cut it off. A fingerprint, Pete brightened. Those fat fingers. Which one? The big one, answered Herbert, and he became visibly nervous. Untie my hand and I'll open it. Take the money. I don't care. No, said the ringleader. Why bother? You're the one who has to get up. Go to the safe. All the two of us have to carry you back and forth. No, that's not gonna work. All right, Mickey, get the knife. Mickey. His partner in crime started going through his pockets. He had a puzzled look on his face, like he just remembered he'd forgotten to buy bread or sour cream at the store. And the more he made, the more Pete became exasperated. He said to bring a knife. Everyone knows Mike's a master with a blade. What's this dumbass gonna torture the judge with? A finger? He's gone, Mike said guiltily. You're the one who's screwed. Pete yelled. Do you have a knife at home? The leader asked the judge. No, replied Herbert. We don't cook for ourselves. Of course he was lying, or even mocking. Mike swung to give the prisoner another blow, but Pete took his arm. He looked at the judge and smiled his ugliest smile. That fool thinks they're just thieves, petty jacks. In fact, they've made a mess of things. The same ones Frankie went to jail for. 
Do you remember what Frankie was on trial for? Pete asked. Yes, Herbert answered. Of course I do. Murder with particular cruelty, for profit. Was that enough evidence? The ringleader grinned. It's all in plain sight. We did a clean job that time. I was convinced it was him, the judge explained. He was convinced, Pete said. Left witnesses, knife planted. Frankie worked like a god. I think I can see who helped him now, said Herbert. That character couldn't have done something like that alone. That's right, Pate said. He wasn't lying when he said he didn't torture the patient. It was a non-literal word for a poor man who had bled to death after being stamped repeatedly with a knife and a hammer. Looking into his eyes, Herbert saw the fire of madness. Dozens, hundreds of criminals had passed through him, and he seemed to have learned to read their minds. Frankie wasn't lying, Pete repeated, but he didn't turn me in, and neither did Mike, and you shouldn't have judged him. What difference does it make? Herbert shrugged. The verdict's in, there's nothing I can do about it. Anyway, either you tell me where you keep a good knife, Pete began, or I'll go outside, go over to the barbecue, and get a hatchet. I saw it on the way over here and I'll chop off your whole hand. So be it, exhaled the judge. Yeah, the safe was stupid. He didn't want to lose a finger to modern technology. Knives in the kitchen. I don't know how you guys didn't figure that out. The bell, a real bell on a real doorbell. Mike raised his gun in surprise and accidentally pulled the trigger. The gunshot filled the room with the smell of smoke and Pete's ears whistled. What an armless stretch. The judge chuckled he was amused. Looking at that satisfied face, Pete wanted to do him right now, but he held back. The time hadn't come yet. Pete knew he wasn't cut out for a family. He'd had a few homes in his life where he'd been welcomed like family. And at first, he'd enjoyed it. The first three or four days. And then, then the women asked too much, like not looking at other skirts, and not to take them home. Is it his fault they choose him? There came a point in his life with Barbara when he got bored with her, and he was just looking for an excuse to leave her. You love her, don't you? Are you sure you're not deceiving me? Barbara asked him in a playful voice, as if she were talking to a child. She was crazy about Pete. Bold, strong, bossy, a real man's man. She'd never met anyone like him in her whole life. No, her lover smiled. No, he'd never cheated anyone. For as long as she could remember, Barbara had felt sorry for herself. In her 38 years, she'd given up her career as a teacher to have a child, divorced her husband, and looked for any kind of part-time work, just to make ends meet. For two years now, she has been cleaning the house of a judge. She doesn't know who he is, what court he is from, she only knows that he is a big man. And if Herbert can still be tolerated, he is silent all the time. But his chatty wife, I can't stand it. Everything's wrong with her. Didn't mop the floors right. Cleaned the oven wrong. She left a scratch on the expensive faucet. I can't believe it. And they pay her three pennies, but she's broke. The judge, of course, gets a normal salary, Barbara thought aloud. But it wouldn't be enough. You know how much houses cost on the hills. Pete was silent. He didn't know. Having spent his entire childhood on the balls, he had a vague idea of paying for electricity, water, gas, and land taxes. That wasn't the way it was done in his den. And then there are the prisons, the lockups, the colonies. You pay there for years, so you don't think much about money. The point is, his wife sells houses, Barbara explained. She's a realtor, and somehow her clients are connected to the judge. Well, I guess so. And Herbert himself is complicated, too. He's the only heir to some kind of family. So he's got it all, all the money. They only drive Mercedes. All their clothes, every last sock is brand name. So they sit on the money, and they sleep on it. Look at this, she pulls out her phone and shows me around. The judge's house is the only thing they talk about. Money, money. No, her first and only. 
Husband didn't drink or smoke. He was just greedy, stingy. He never once invited her to a movie or a cafe, but only drove her Cadillac to the countryside. Well, what happens there? That's right, unplanned children appear in nature. When he found out, he yelled at first, demanded not to have the baby. But going to the doctor is also money, and he was sorry. Besides, he found out that every mother gets an allowance, and then he offered to live together. He got a notebook and wrote everything down in it. Every sneeze, every penny. Not a husband, just an accountant. They had money, in short. Barbara rolled her eyes dreamily. The chickens wouldn't peck, and they pay me three kopecks. Barbara began to cry with resentment. Her first, and only, husband wrote everything down in his notebook, every penny, and he forbade his son to buy yogurt. So he didn't give her anything at all, he took all her allowance. Like he had to keep a budget. She was almost starving, and she couldn't figure out where the money went. She couldn't stand it and left. Where's the money? Pete asked lazily, but he memorized everything. It is known where in the safe. Barbara answered and she also showed the picture. Pete was not like her ex. He spared nothing for her, and especially often he gave her jewelry. Even though they weren't new, that was nothing. This necklace has a scratch on it, and this chain has a black dot on it, and he told me not to wear it or they'd steal it. He was thoughtful, took her to restaurants, and once he even beat up a waiter. He brought her steak and potatoes, and there was a hair on the plate. Not even a hair, a hair. If she'd been alone, she'd have just cleaned it up and eaten, and then leave a tip. But Pete's not like that, no. He knows his rights. And when the waiter said something wrong, a little bit rude, that's when it started. Oh, he gave him a beating. Barbara was crazy about this tough guy. I don't care if he was six years younger. Love doesn't look for peers. And you saw it, Pete yawned. That money. You're imagining things, sweetheart. Where does an honest judge get money from? He's a decent man, living on his salary. Yes, of course, Barbara said. On his salary, yes. There's a safe in the bedroom. The judge's cheap wife opened it once, and I was walking down the corridor. So she didn't see me. She didn't notice me. She doesn't notice anything but herself. There were green packets in there. Wraps, just like in a jar. I don't think they were wrappers. And above them, you know, there was a huge cannon. It's like the king of cannons. It's all right. We'll get rich too, Pate said, hugging his mistress. Come here, baby. Oh, by the way, she's gabbing. The judge is alone on November 11th. Can you believe it? His wife's out there spending money. Sailor Schmeiler. And Herbert's given me a vacation until the 14th. We could go somewhere with you. I've got some money saved up that I can afford. Of course, Pete answered. He was getting tired of this woman. No, nothing like that. She's still pretty good looking, good figure. And every day she crawls around the judge's house on her knees, collecting dust. And that smile. And she looked at him with love. You could feel it. Pete never suffered from a lack of female attention. All his ladies were beautiful, and they all loved him. He didn't. It wasn't Barbara's figure, of course, or her small apartment on the outskirts of town. He didn't care where he lived. And it wasn't his mistress. He'd never been picky or choosy. No, she was good. Except that she talked a lot. Too much. He would have liked to lie in silence, to think over all the details of the plan. Now, if anything happened, she'd be sure to rat him out. Anyway, Barbara was talking nonstop, talking so loudly that Pete had a headache. It was all a couple days ago, and it feels like a lifetime ago. But now Barbara won't say anything to anyone. Never. The doorbell rings. The sound is exactly what it should be in a big house. Loud, demanding enough to be heard even on the second floor and the little bugger who pulled the trigger out of surprise. Now, a visitor's not gonna just walk away, might even suspect something wrong. The shot made the judge jerk, and the robbers pretended everything was going according to plan. 
but Pete was really scared, and his first thought was to run, jump out the window. Are you waiting for someone? Pete asked, yawning. Yes, Herbert answered. His voice was calm again, though blood was still oozing from the wound above his eye, and the prospect of losing a finger was truly frightening. Who's that? Pete wondered. It's late. It's past your bedtime for old men like you. The mistress, the judge shrugged. She always comes like that, when the wife isn't home. Who the hell is the mistress? Mike exploded, grabbing Herbert by his pajamas. You old devil, a beautiful one. The judge replied and immediately took another punch in the face. His cheekbone burned with a fire of pain. Pretty, Mike thought. Pretty is good. They're still looking at life in prison for killing the judge. So if you add in the abuse of a beautiful woman, it wouldn't change much. That's if they get caught. And if they don't, then one more, one less makes no difference. The bell rang again. How do they live here? It's so loud. It's like it's ringing right over your ear. Pete couldn't concentrate properly because of the ringing. We should open it, Mike said. No, Pete said. It'll ring and then go away. We should open it, Mike said again. What if she saw us? What if she heard a gunshot? What if she calls the cops? Women are like that. They get nervous when they see something. How would you know? Thought Pete. He knew his partner in crime had no luck with women. We'll get her and that, Mike went on. It seems he's already got lustful plans for this woman he's never even met. Pete thought for a moment. On the one hand, the jackal was right. The judge's mistress could have seen the light in the window. And how could she not have heard the shot? She wouldn't leave, she'd break in, or even open the door with her own key. Who knows what kind of manners there are here? Barbara didn't say anything about a mistress. She might not have known. On the other hand, the lustful fire in Mike's eyes made it clear what he wanted to do with the woman. Masks, Pete said. You stay here and don't go anywhere. Okay. Okay, Herbert replied. I'll sleep while you and my mistress have fun. It's night, and he's sitting in his old Ford playing a chess game in his mind with himself. Surprisingly boring, if you ask me. Why does everyone think chess players are so special? That their intelligence, ingenuity, and diligence will give them something in life. Another disappointment is the public perception of police work. In the movies, cops sit in cafes all the time, eating donuts and drinking coffee. For his 20 years of impeccable service, Felix has never once had a good vacation and did not even go to the sea. He had already reached the rank of major, but still sat his pants in ambushes, solved the most complex crimes, and he could not even make repairs at home. No time. Why would he renovate a house he's never in? Harry, where the hell are you? He asked into the phone. His partner's sleepy voice was more eloquent than any words. Sorry, boss, overslept, he answered, yawning. Here, I'm getting in the car now. Here, I'm on my way. We discussed and planned everything, gah. Felix hissed. Do you realize what he's risking? Do you realize what will happen to us if anything happens? I'm on my way, boss, Harry continued. Here, I'm putting my pants on. Give me 30 minutes. Oh, shit. Felix exhaled and hung up. The lights came on on the second floor of the judge's mansion, right in the bedroom windows. Had he missed them? No way. They must have come in through the back patio, the way Barbara had set him off. Right past him, Felix. Or did the judge just get tired of waiting and decide to call it quits? Should I call him right now? No, we can't risk it. Felix got out of the car. Despite his considerable size, and he weighed more than a hundred kilograms, the detective moved surprisingly easily and quickly. He ran to the gate. Oh shit, it's locked. Who locked it? He swung over the fence, although the extra pounds immediately made his joints suffer. Rounded the house and ran to the front door. Damn it, it's open. He was alone, no partner, no force support, not even armor. 
There was body armor on his mighty body, but it was a lot of pressure. It's a problem to spend an hour in it, but what if you have to sit in an ambush all night? Armor's great when you're trying it on in the armory, but as soon as you go out into the field, you die. The detective carefully opened the door, stuck his nose inside, so they got through. He missed them, all smart and professional. All right, let's listen. Herbert's a tough guy. He was in the Marines. He's the kind of guy who doesn't whine. There were voices coming from the second floor. Of course, he could rush up there right now, shoot the thugs. They walked slowly down the stairs, looking around. From here, they couldn't see whether someone was standing on the doorstep or not. If it was a woman, she would know how difficult it was for elderly men to get out of bed and down from the second floor. She'll wait. We need a plan. And the ringleader was frantically thinking of one. I'll go out the back, Pete whispered. You wait half a minute and then slowly, barely, open the door. You just open it. Don't come out. And when she comes in, we pack. You in the front, me in the back. You got it. Aha. Uh -huh. With the Glock in his waistband, Pete ran through the judge's precinct. The grounds had clearly been done by an expensive gardener, and the area looked more like a park. I wish I hadn't tricked. Pete thought as he made his way around bushes, plants, and decorative rocks. The front door was empty. No one. Then it swung open and slowly opened inward. Taking out a Glock, Pete took a step inside and immediately got hit on the head with a hard object. Holy shit! The ringleader swore. You hit like a woman. Where's the broad? Mike asked. I don't know, Pete said. She left. There was no one there. Probably didn't wait, Mike shrugged. Maybe they have some kind of signal. Enough fantasizing. Pete rubbed his bruised head. Change of plan. We go upstairs, open the safe, and kill the judge. What about torture? Mike objected. I'm getting ready to get my ass kicked in here. Shut up, Pete demanded. Go to the kitchen and get a knife. No, I'll pick it out. The leader darted into the living room, where there was an oven, a dishwasher, a sensor-controlled hood, and other trappings of the luxurious life of cooking at home and for yourself. Drawers, drawers, drawers. Where are the knives? Mike started going through the drawers, opening them and throwing out plates, pots, spoons, and cookware. He didn't know their names anyway. Looking for this, Mike asked, pointing to the knife rack. Shut up, Pete yelled. The sidekick was getting on his nerves. The leader chose a long serrated knife and a pair of fish shears. Just in case, Pete imagined the judge yelling and lashing out as he cut off his finger. Oh, what a good feeling. Avenge all the thieves, robbers and thugs who'd been innocently convicted. Mike picked up some kind of knife, too, but a simpler one. I'll cut it myself. Pete muttered as they made their way to the second floor. Chief, let me do it. Mike started to argue. I'm a professional. Shut up, said the leader. I'm in charge here. What? Mike was indignant, blocking the stairs. Say that again, Pete said, and slapped the jackal on the cheek. The jackal swallowed his insult like he always did. Well, chief, whimpered the sidekick. The main thing is to know how to approach him, and then he's like silk. Why is everyone so afraid of him? All right, Pete said conciliatingly. Cut off his other one, or his nose, whatever you want. Can I have an ear? Mike smiled with his black teeth. You can, nodded the leader. And while he's writhing around in blood, get in the car and get the canister. You got it. Uh-huh. I got a feeling, you know like we're not doing enough, you know? Pete froze in front of the bedroom, and Mike crashed into him. I don't get it, thought the thug. How is this possible? There you go, there you go, whispered the jackal. How is that possible? Pete looked in front of him and didn't understand anything either. He was scared, but he didn't show it. You can never admit you're scared. You'll lose face. You have to be calm, confident, and assertive. 
That's the kind of man women like. But, but for some reason his hands began to tremble. They had another fight. They fought again. They fought like hell. Why can't her mother be a normal person? Why does she always want to be in control? She'd always try to live up to her parents' expectations, of course. But Laura was different at heart. Not the way her parents had raised her or the teachers at school had seen her. At heart, she wanted to be a bully, wanted to be reached out to. Then they went to some fancy boutique, where mom made a scene because the cooler with free water was empty. She almost cried when the skinny girl, a consultant, changed the huge bottle. And when Laura wanted to help her, her mother roughly grabbed her shoulder, so hard that she left finger marks. Then she demanded a huge discount. And even when it seemed that Dionysus himself, the god of commerce, apologized from heaven for the awkwardness still left offended. So Laura ran away. The hour is late, so it would be quite possible to walk to the mansion, go up to her room and relax. That's okay. The guest house would be quite suitable to spend the night too. Get some rest, get my thoughts together properly. Her parents don't know that this outhouse has long been her secret hideout. Why? They don't get many visitors anyway. Except for her. Laura walked across the property and quietly went inside. Ever since she was a little girl, her parents had been nagging her about money. And now she is 18, and she wants to feel life. The very taste of life. To order in a French restaurant not French fries, but some exquisite dish, which, according to legend, was invented by Napoleon. Throwing yourself at a store clerk just because it's the right thing to do. Tip her. And she listens to 24 by 7 about how important it is to follow her mother and father's instructions to get anywhere in life. They sent her to this college, but she doesn't want to be a lawyer or a realtor. She likes to draw, dance and sing, making funny TikTok videos. She's a creative person, and her stale parents don't even have a spark of inspiration. All Stu has to do is climb the fence carefully, so his dad doesn't see him. He comes over a lot, and her parents don't approve. Well, mostly mom disapproves, but dad doesn't even mind. Dad spoils her with everything but attention. Stu in the guest house, they either don't notice or pretend not to. But she's 18 now. She can do whatever she wants. My body is my business. Stu's good. He's beautiful in every way. And how much he loves her. I don't think she'll ever meet another man in her life who's so close, so sincere, so her own. But in her mother's opinion, he has a huge flaw. A gigantic one. He comes from a very simple family. His parents never earned anything and rent a small apartment under the mountain. She has opportunities and connections. When she got the name and patronymic of her daughter's boyfriend, she immediately found out their entire history down to the third knee. And she gave her ruthless verdict, poverty. For a mother, it's the worst disease of all. You might think that a person's virtue is measured by his income or property. But parents think like this. If you're poor, stay away from my daughter. Mom wants the children of ministers and other bigwigs, TV anchors, politicians. She already wiped her tongue in blood, telling me how important it is to get married right. Mom, what husband? I'm 18 years old, and if she ever marries, it will be for love. If she ever has children, it'll be with her own man. She threw off every last bit of her clothes and went into the bathroom. Even here, in the guest house, her parents had spared no expense. Huge, with a jacuzzi tub, just a pleasure machine. A special pump filled it with water, a temperature that could be adjusted to a degree in a matter of minutes. I looked at myself critically in the huge mirror. Yeah, the sides could use a little trimming, and a tighter stomach. I should definitely do sports, go to the gym. But... Mom was always missing there, so she wanted to do the opposite. It's easy enough to go on a diet, but Stu loves her just the way she is, which he's always emphasized, by the way. Throwing a foam bomb into the water, she slowly submerged herself in. The warmth and fragrant smell immediately filled her soul with peace. 
She unraveled her white hair and placed her head on the special recess. God, it felt so good, so comfortable. When Stu came, she would be waiting for him. She'll take him in her arms, tell him everything that's in her soul, and he'll listen, listen, listen. Castles and rich houses have secret rooms, halls, and galleries. It's as if wealthy people have the secret of the fourth dimension, the one that could be extended indefinitely. How am I any worse? Thought Herbert when they designed the house. It was done by his own people, so they were willing to do whatever he wanted, knowing his finances. No, his mansion wasn't like a castle, although Herbert's blue blood demanded something like that. In this fashionable neighborhood, where he'd barely bought a plot of land, he'd be misunderstood. He had pledged not to build a structure higher than 10 meters with a chimney and a weather vane. What's a castle without a tower? He had to settle for a rather compact but rather luxurious mansion. Obeying the instincts of an ancient family, he laid a secret passage through which he could escape, to leave, to vaporize, to vanish. It was how the nobles had escaped sieges and attacks in their castles hundreds and even thousands of years ago. Moving along the secret corridor, the judge felt something similar. True, he wasn't going to go far. This house had been built ten years ago and had been designed even earlier. Sylvia, of course, had objected to the county thing. She's a realtor. She knows how to count money. What she couldn't understand was how to reflect these hidden squares in the blueprints. How to hide your own secret passageways from friends who need to show off. We won't be able to sell it later, she said. No way, replied the judge. I'll never sell it. I'll die here. Herbert was adamant. Even then, more than a decade ago, he had put a lot of bad guys behind bars. Gradually, the number had gotten over a hundred and he'd lost count. Who knows if one of these thugs might want to come in to get even. Such ideas must have visited the accused at least once when they sat on the other side of the iron cage. Not right away, but after the verdict is announced. When you're a judge at that level, when you're working with murderers, rapists, and crime kings, you have to be prepared for anything. But that wasn't the case at all. Herbert had a very strange relationship with the law. Maybe he had once dreamed of changing the world and putting all criminals behind bars. But even then, that wasn't his main concern. It was not for the justice of the world that he spent years doing the rough work, passing exams and obtaining permits, convincing all kinds of examiners of the purity of his thoughts. Herbert, as a man of passion and adventure, simply loved adrenaline. He liked to be the center of attention. All those journalists, lawyers, assistants, and all eyes are directed at him. He is the king and lord of Themis. He can pardon or put away. He is the embodiment of Themis. What a heady feeling. And when Felix, his old acquaintance, not friend by any means, voiced his plan, the judge laughed at first. Yes, it was funny to him. The detective wants the two thugs to be tried by the law. No. Think about it. And then Felix played a very different tune. He offered to get justice on his own, and he got through to the judge's heart. Herbert liked that, but... Understand, said the detective, sitting in a leather chair. In the judge's chambers, they were just like that. I mean, they're serious. I know these guys well. They'll stop at nothing. They'll spend years figuring out how to get to you so they can send you to the afterlife if it's just you. I understand, Herbert nodded. At first, he listened to Felix half-heartedly, going through his papers. His upbringing and corporate ethics did not allow him to kick him out. If he came, he could sit there until he got bored. We must, continued the detective. We have to stop them. Well, stop them, the judge sneered. The case is very delicate. Mr. Herbert, Felix wouldn't stop. Tell me honestly, has it ever upset you that we have a ban on the death penalty? The lights in the secret part of the mansion did not work, and he had to move in pitch darkness. The fuses must have blown, and he didn't notice. The judge didn't come here often, so he wasn't sure he remembered the layout down to the meter. 
three flights of stairs, then a small tunnel. You could call it a corridor. At the end of the tunnel, no, not a light. There's a room, the most secret room in the neighborhood, his own private secret office. He never imagined when he agreed to Felix's venture that someone would scout this part of the mansion. Showing off the escape staircase and room wasn't part of his plan. Not even his wife has access to this place. Maybe we can keep it a secret. The death penalty, the judge haughtily told Felix then. Mr. Detective, the correct word is capital punishment, and it's not outlawed. There's just a moratorium on its use. I'm a member of the judiciary. You should go to the legislature, speak in parliament, maybe convince them of your rightness. So, let's do it ourselves, smiled the detective. What are these legislators to us? Indeed, smirked the judge. All they do is make up laws. My God, who am I hearing this from? Yes, that's all. Felix smiled his predatory smile. It didn't scare the judge, but it made an impression. Laws are like that, like a mirror. Whichever way you look at it, that's what it reflects. You know who's sleeping with your Barbara. Years on the job have taught Herbert to hide his emotions and even his feelings. So when Felix said, with your Barbara, he could barely contain himself. Who does that cop think he is? Okay, she comes into his office, insults the legislature, but there's a limit to everything. No, Barbara wasn't his. She was a nice looking woman, but there's hundreds of them. She just cleaned his mansion because Sylvia's lazy and rich. Even if he hugged Barbara a couple times and kissed her on the cheek, it's none of the detective's business. And he could hardly know for sure what had happened or would happen between them. It's none of my business, the judge replied. She's just a housekeeper. There were before her. There will be after her. Let her sleep with whom she pleases. I bless her. With Pete, the detective continued, staring at the judge. Dirty Pete. You scoundrel. Herbert slammed his fist on the table. He felt hot and jumped up from his luxurious leather chair. It can't be. How did that scoundrel even come upon her? He himself, himself, had chosen a woman who would have a minimum of social contacts. How long ago? I do not know, yawned Felix. He was in no hurry. Realized the judge was on the case. I've only been watching him for a month ever since you put Frankie behind bars. Why did I trust those ash holes? Thought the judge as he went down the secret staircase. Why did I agree to help? Going over the events of the night in his head, he didn't even know at what exact moment things had gone wrong. At first, Felix had said he'd be on duty alone with a partner, no force support. He's an experienced detective, of course, but Barbara must have gotten it all wrong. The big sale starts at zero hour on November 11th. That's why he sent his family on vacation on the ninth night. So they could be the first to get to an Apple store and buy the latest gadgets. And on the 10th, he waited for guests. He waited all night and not just him, but a bunch of cops. No one came. Then it became clear that the thugs might show up on the 11th. Or not show up at all, Felix said. But that's unlikely. I'll still be on duty. Don't worry, the team is close by. We'll have them on the alert in no time. Then he, an experienced judge, simply lay down on the bed. To lie down, for he had not slept a wink all the night before, and what sleep was there in the daytime? He put on his pajamas just to look good. You wouldn't just lie on the bed in jeans, would you? And then, then, Dirty Pete and Stuffy Mike woke him up. For a few long minutes, while Herbert waited for help, he was really scared. Here came the iron door, felt it with his hand. Thank God, he had not mistaken the direction. In his hands he clutched his rifle, which he had taken from the safe. It was a good time to remember his army past. Now he'd sit in ambush and guard those bastards. Of course, the cold November weather wasn't conducive to waiting, but it wasn't likely to last long. The disguised door from the secret room led to the garage, where it was camouflaged as a tool cabinet. To get out, he had to bend over three times. 
In fact, he never used that exit, and he went to his secret room from the bedroom for certain reasons. Running out into the lot, Herbert rushed toward the rockery. Going around the back of it, he lay down on the fanciful composition of rocks and plants. It was a little rough, but it would do. He put three bullets in those thugs' foreheads for every punch to the face, and then he'll deal with Felix. Is it stupidity or treachery? There he is, one of them, sneaking up to the guest house. It's him. Black jeans, jacket, broad shoulders, stuffy Mike, no less. Why'd they name him that, by the way? All right, so they've already searched the mansion. They're fast guys, that's for sure. Herbert pulled the trigger and pointed the barrel at the dark figure. He held his breath and began to count the beats of his own heart. One, two, three. Slowly, carefully pulled the trigger. The silence of the night was broken by a powerful shot from his state-of-the-art rifle and a flash. As the robbers got used to the idea that the judge had disappeared, they began to look around. Basically, nothing had changed. Only the safe was open. Near it lay the chair to which Herbert had been tied. The rest of the stop remained untouched. Where did he disappear to? Out the window? Or is he sitting in ambush on the second floor? Look, Mike said, pointing his gun at the safe. The money. Yeah, Pete nodded. Money's a loose term. That judge has got as much money as a bank. On the shelves were Franklin's and Grant's, tied up with colorful rubber bands. They were accompanied by some papers, probably stocks and other useless documents Pete didn't know anything about. And above them was a void. The King of Guns, as Barbara had called it, was gone. Far from the fact that this superweapon even existed, though, the cleaning lady could have lied, confused and embellished. I mean, she used to, but now she can't do anything at all. On the other hand, after the night raid, she'd have to find a new job one way or another, which she might not have experienced, so he'd done the right thing, as he always did. How did you tie him up? Pete asked disappointedly. No, really. Like always, Mike told him. Tight. He tied him up pretty good. But the judge must have just lifted the legs of the chair and freed his limbs. First the legs, then the arms. If a man wants to live, all knots are powerless. In the time it took them to go downstairs, check the visitor and look for the knife, they could have run to the Chinese border. What do we do now? We take the money and go, Mike said, pulling a bag out of his pocket. He's a hoarder. No, Pete said. We didn't come here for that. What do you mean? Mike was surprised. You said we'd bomb the place like we always do. You stupid pig, Pete hissed. I said come in, take out the judge and take the money. It's all about him, not the money. Hey, chief, come on, man. Mike said it offensively. Why do you always have to humiliate me? I didn't know it was so important for you to work wet. I just don't like it. I don't want you and me to go to jail forever. You couldn't be more precise, Pete thought. The plans coming apart at the seams. They stood in the spacious bedroom of the judge who'd sent their best friend to life. They were debating whether to run away or play with fate a little longer. Suddenly, the phone rang. The ringleader heard the tune, the sound of the cheapest of handsets. It was unlikely that their expensive judge was using one. Fuck, did you take the phone to the case? Pete hissed grabbing his accomplice by the shoulder. It's a lefty, Mike lied. He'd just forgotten to put his phone out. Don't take it off, Pete demanded. Turn off your cell phone. Yeah, that fool's gonna ruin them. He's got his cell phone with him. Think about it. The ringleader took a couple of steps into the huge bedroom and suddenly, no, look at this. What is that? It's like the bookcase has pulled away from the wall a little bit. Pete pulled it towards him out of sheer curiosity, and the piece of furniture, bulky and heavy, suddenly moved easily to the side, and behind it opened. You got a flashlight? Pete asked. Sure, boss. Then go ahead, said the leader, pointing his gun into the darkness. If you see him, shoot him. 
I'll be right here on the lookout, and I'll collect the dough in the meantime. Mike sighed, took out a flashlight, and walked away. He smiled and disappeared into this strange tunnel as if he had to. After waiting a few seconds, Dirty Pete pulled the bookcase back tightly, pulled it toward him. It wouldn't open again. I guess I'd have to pull on some volume. It didn't matter anymore, though. If Mike got lost in the bowels of this luxurious house, he'd get lost. Here, near the closet, was a backpack, the kind of bag that rich people usually used to carry their sneakers to their personal fitness trainer. After shaking the shoes out of it, Pete ran over to the safe and started putting money into it. Each stack 10,000, 15, 20, 30 watts, $370,000. That was a heavy bag. He's rich. Why doesn't this pump trust banks? Mike's a fool, of course. Let the police catch him. The judge said they wouldn't make it to trial, but he's got about 10 minutes to spare. Until Hera gets to the phone, until the police get a patrol out here, until... Pete threw everything they'd found earlier into the bag, and suddenly he heard a shot, loud and powerful. Mike's gun doesn't make that kind of sound. Did that mean he no longer had an accomplice? Stu envisioned how good he'd feel. No, not now, not in a couple years, when he got his way. Laura wasn't beautiful, a little overweight, a little weird, and her closet was ridiculous. But when her mother dresses her up, when she calls her personal hairdresser, it's a different matter. No, of course he loved her in his own way. A beautiful young girl, neat and tidy, and he's an unpretentious guy. But that wasn't the main thing about her. Absolutely not. Laura was the only daughter of Herbert the First Excellent. That was the faculty name of her father, the famous judge. There was no doubt that in time it would be Excellent who would lead the country's judicial system. At the very least, a descendant of an ancient family with money like leaves on a maple tree. And their home. As Stu wandered the corridors of the luxurious mansion, as they poured rabbit stew into a porcelain plate, he felt he had touched something beautiful. It was Laura's mother, that imperious and pompous woman named Sylvia, who spoiled everything. Herbert seemed to accept him, if he was at all interested in his daughter's life. But this megalomaniac never did. Of course, without such a father and home, Laura would never have interested him. He's an ex-football player, tall and stout, smart, charming, and handsome. Girls are so hung up on him. He was good at soccer, but not good enough to be a world-class star. Well, or at least a strong middleweight, so without doubt parted with cleats, gaiters, and shorts, and began to storm the university. At the first attempt, of course, nothing worked out. He was beginning to worry that he would have to go to work as a coach at some school. He spent nights sitting over textbooks, reading, arguing on the internet. That's when he met Laura, right there on the net. She was still in high school, all airy and dreamy. Her last name immediately struck him as familiar. And from there, it was just like that. He got into university. He met Mr. Herbert. He became Laura's official boyfriend, though she didn't take to it with much enthusiasm. Now they studied side by side, she at college and he at university, and they saw each other almost every day. He was doing everything he could to become her husband in the near future. This was his ticket to the big time, and he took his relationship with the judge's daughter as seriously as it could possibly be. When she texted him that she'd be waiting for him at the guest house, Stu didn't take it too well at first. Actually, he was going to a nightclub with Larissa. Nothing too serious, just a couple of girlfriends. But he promised her a long time ago, and they'd already picked a club. Besides, Laura had left and was supposed to stay in the city for a few days. Why'd she come back? It's okay, Larissa can wait. She's a random person in his life. There will be many more like her, more than a dozen. Laura's another matter. There was no way he could lose her. That's why. That's why he swam over the fence and quietly, like a thief, snuck around the judge's precinct. In fact, he was a thief. Only he wasn't going to steal some little thing 
but everything that belonged to the judge's house, along with the house, along with the daughter. There it is, the guest house, and it looks like she's already looking out the window. Oh, Laura was so sentimental, always saying how much she loved him, how she couldn't live without him. All he had to do was nod and agree. Nonsense, of course, but what was his pity? He'd do anything for a judgeship. Wouldn't Herbert help his dearly beloved son-in-law? Of course he will. He will come and offer everything himself. He found the idea very amusing. It was as if he had heard it or read it. But where? He couldn't remember. Suddenly, in the middle of a clear night, there was thunder. And with it, a bolt of lightning that pierced his body. At least, that's what it seemed to him. It was the last thought Stu had time to think in his inglorious life. And even it wasn't original. Mike slowly made his way down the rough concrete stairs, pondering how unfair his life was. Always on the sidelines, even Dirty Pete can slap him in the face just to vent his anger. The girls laugh at his teeth and send him away. Except the ones for whom taking on jackals like him is a profession. But nothing will change after this case. He'll be the talk of the town. First, he'll take down that judge. I didn't even recognize him. It was Hera who baptized him 12 years ago. He sentenced him, a 16-year-old boy, to juvie. And at the same time, he gave him a nickname, Stuffy. Because he was so hot, he was sweating and begging for a window. And the judge smirked. Stuffy. Hera asked then, It's all right, you'll bear it. The accidental nickname stuck to him for the rest of his life. First the guards called him that, then his cellmates, and then everyone. But he begged, 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 call me Mickey, like Mickey Rourke, or Mickey Mouse. But the people around him were adamant, so he became Douchy, or at best Mike. First term was the dumbest thing ever. Broke into someone's house for no reason, no particular purpose. He saw some nice clothes, expensive, new clothes. I changed. Thought the house was empty, but the owner's daughter was there. He just got scared and didn't do anything, even though he could have. He would have done something now, but not then. He just ran away, happy to be dressed nice. Walked around the neighborhood like a turkey, showing off. Till the cops picked him up tonight, they mocked and jeered at him. All because he'd left his jacket at the scene of the crime, with his card from the school for troubled teens. Hera also laughed when he interrogated him and got to that inglorious moment. Two years of juvenile detention. That was tough. Perhaps he hadn't even had a decent meal in two years. And not once did his mom come to bring him a bun or a candy bar. But it's okay, Mike didn't break. He learned to steal chocolates and buns from his cellmates, or rather, there they were called differently from his comrades. There he learned other useful things. For example, to send the tutors, who were more like wardens far away, to ignore any work, even if the class as a whole was interesting to him. For this reason, Mike had to grind through his two years day by day. And in the end, he was given a disgusting, unreformable characterization. So when he was caught by the cops again a couple months after his release, his fate was sealed. Again the isolation center, again imprisonment, only in an adult colony. So he traveled through camps and prisons, small terms in the zone, and even less weeks in freedom. The whole world had already given up on Mike. A thief, a vagrant, what can you take from him? He'd go out, knock over some house and start all over again. The judges even seemed to take pity on him, giving him short sentences. That was until he met Pete and Frankie. Things were different in their new gang. It's been two years since he's been on the outside. No more petty theft. Every job has to be thought out, Pete used to say. He had a plan down to the smallest detail. He knew how to inspire. He knew how to push. All in all, he was a great guy. And I think Pete taught him how to think. And most importantly, to be different. Pushy, brash doesn't always work for a criminal. Sometimes you have to be gentle and tender so that your victim can relax 
But Mike saw Pete's flaw a long time ago. He's a coward. He's afraid of everything. On all his cases, he never got his hands wet. It was him, Mike, who used a knife, a gun, or his bare hands. The boss could swing his fists, but that's about it. And Pete was never the first to enter another man's home or office. But Mike had a secret, too. He was the exact opposite of Pete and felt no fear at all. Now, as he walked down the concrete stairs, he looked around curiously. Where was that judge hiding? Hide or not, I'll find you anyway. And I won't be in a hurry, no. Behind his belt was a huge knife he picked up in the kitchen. No, the judge needs some work. The stairs ended. He pushed the door open slowly. It wasn't an easy door. He'd seen them in lockups and prisons before. There was a viewing window on the door and a hinge part for serving plates. Wow, what's this judge doing here? Role-playing with his wife or something. Mike took the latch off, shined the light inside, quiet, safe. The room was cool and damp. It must not have been heated, unlike the house. The flashlight beam traveled along the walls. The room was small, and the concrete floor and walls made it look like a cell in a prison. He shined the light some more. There was a toilet in the corner and bunks attached to the wall. Wow! On the other wall are neat installations made of wood. Some kind of shelves screw to the wall. Small ones, because the big ones wouldn't fit in here. Mike got curious. Inside each picture, as the thug called it, was a large photograph and text. He couldn't read very well, but he recognized the faces in the pictures immediately. Puckett, he thought. Gosha Puckett disappeared three years ago, and this is the senator. They called him that because he always wore a suit to work. He's gone, too. Since Mike didn't feel fear, he felt confusion. On the two remaining installations were portraits of Sini Bolshoi and Vovchik. The latter's nickname persistently did not stick. All these honorable people were united by two small nuances. First, they were criminals, and not just any second-rate thieves. The elite of the criminal world. They were feared and respected by right. Secondly, they'd all gone missing in recent years. Basically, for a criminal, sudden disappearance is the norm. Always gotta lay low, wait for the cops to calm down. These guys just disappeared into thin air. Rumors have been flying around the neighborhood that it wasn't an accident. But by and large, thugs don't care about each other. But that's not the only thing that surprised him. In this impromptu exhibit of missing criminals, there were two empty spaces, separate niches, also very nice and neat. The judge wasn't here. If he built the cell, he didn't build it for himself. Part of the concrete wall had been moved forward. Mike shown another small passageway there. Fortunately, he knew the purpose of the next room quite well. A garage, an expensive roll-up gate lifted open. Mike turned off the flashlight, walked to the side of the exit, and carefully looked ahead. Suddenly there was a flash, and a large guy could be seen falling to the ground. Was this part of Pete's plan? And who was the underdog? Pulling out his gun, Mike lay down on the ground and carefully crawled to the side so that his black clothes blended in with the ground. Standing in the shade of a tree, Felix observed the situation. Okay, here came the judge out of the garage, with his giant gun at his side. Thank God he's alive, so at least nothing irreparable happened here. The justice's gun was a big gun. Rambo himself would have envied such a gun. The judge moved quickly and surprisingly easy adrenaline. Tomorrow it'll break every bone in his body. We've been there, we know. The rifle certainly deserve respect. Probably bought the most expensive and largest one in the gun shop, thought the detective. Looking at the judge, safe and sound, he was greatly relieved. Here Herbert ran up to some artistic pile of stones for which all the rich men groan and weep so much. He lay down on top of it on a patch of grass. Silence. All the lights are out, but thanks to the cloudless sky and the full moon, the situation is clearly visible. There's a man sneaking around the plot. Wait a minute. 
Who's that? Looks like Mike, but it's definitely not him. What's with all the criminals out on the prowl tonight? They're coming to the judge's house in droves. Definitely a thief, Felix thought, as he watched the dark figure look around. He's going straight to the small outbuilding. How small? Only against the backdrop of a huge shack. Well, let him go, and we'll deal with him later. But apparently Herbert thought otherwise, or he had decided to deal with all the shady personalities who had flown into his precinct. Here the judge raised the barrel and began to repeat the trajectory of the sneak. Spellbound, Felix stared at him, but could not even think what would happen in the next second. The detective did not have time to realize anything as a rasping shot rang out and the burned gunpowder illuminated the area for a second. The thief collapsed to the ground, an accurate shot. The detective dismounted from his position and ran along the fence toward Herbert so that he would not inadvertently come under the judge's fire. Hiding behind the barn, Herbert continued to watch the exit from his mansion. It was unlikely that the remaining burglar would go to the back door. Besides, it was locked securely, so it was necessary to wait a little until the second thug appeared in the target zone. And to get him away from the door a little bit, I don't want to damage the finish. His wife will take his head off and she'll be right. Sylvia would charge him for the hole in the bedroom ceiling. Let him run, Herbert thought. He liked hunting, though the last time he had gone after game was many years ago. Let him. You can't run away from me. Suddenly, the judge felt a strong hand grasp his shoulder and a second hand lower the barrel to the ground. He turned around, wondering how Pete had gotten around him. He was looking in all directions after all but the strong hands seemed to belong to someone else. Behind him stood the fat detective. How could he sneak in so quietly with his size? His face was confused. Calm down, partner, said the detective. Take it easy, you guys. Where the hell are you? Herbert asked instead of greeting. Where is the other one? Sorry, your honor, said Felix almost sincerely. My partner is in ambush, waiting. No, explained the judge, the second thug. I already got the first one. I got Mike. He's over there, cooling off, and it's your fault, by the way. Herbert, said the detective. I'm sorry, but ah, uh, anyway, it wasn't Mike. It's some kind of a total lefty. Maybe a thief, I don't know. I'd recognize Mike right away. He's taller and bigger. This one's just a kid, not even a belly. Oh shit, the judge whispered. He felt his feet start to get cold. Are you sure? A thousand percent. We should go take a look, said the judge, putting the shotgun away. I think we can help him. Call an ambulance or at least stop the bleeding. No, Felix grabbed Herbert's shoulder. There's nothing you can do to help him. I've seen it a hundred times. Even if he didn't give his soul to God right away, he's dead. You got a big buckshot, and the shot hit him in the chest area. Plus, those bastards are still in there. You come out, you open up. Let's sit in ambush. That kid went that way. The detective pointed to the guest house. It can't be, whispered the judge. I think he saw a light in the window, but not that bright, or was he imagining it? His ears were a little stiff from the gunshot, and his eyes were blurred with light. Where's your phone? He took the receiver from Felix, sat down and began to remember his wife's phone number. Here it was, the 21st century. He used to know several dozen numbers by heart. Why? Because he used to dial them on the machines all the time. First with a round disc, then buttons. And then these smartphones came along. They remember everything. Where you were yesterday. What picture you took a year ago. Come on. My wife's cell phone isn't so easy to forget. He got all the numbers, but the last one. What's on the end, nine or five? Oh shit. The clock on the screen read three in the morning. Right, five is the number of the amendment. Come on, come on, pick up the phone. Honey, he whispered. Darling, it's me. Jira, are you drunk? The wife asked in a sleepy voice. Did you see what time it is? What is this phone? 
I'm fine. Get up right now and go to Laura's room. Are you drunk? Sylvia hissed unhappily. Now, he demanded, and write a message on that phone if she's not there. Herbert pressed the red button, and just in time, the phone began to vibrate, and the screen showed the caller's number and the name Felix the underdog had given him. You couldn't be more precise, thought the judge with a smirk. The sleuth picked up the receiver. Gah, whispered Felix, are you in the area? A couple minutes away, replied his partner. The sound of the street and the rubbing of tires against asphalt could be heard in the background. Phil, the precinct called. Our client's neighbors heard what sounded like gunfire. Yes, answered the detective, looking at Herbert. He moved in close and tried to hear the conversation too. We're aware of it. Everything all right, Phil? Harry asked. Yes, the judge is with me. Our guys are still wandering around the precinct, but it won't be for long. Should we call for backup? Eagles are standing by. Not as many as yesterday, but still. Not yet, Felix answered, and the judge nodded. We'll take them ourselves. Once you're parked, move out to the... The barn, Herbert whispered. We'll try to lure them there. Go to the barn, the detective repeated. Go quietly. And keep your head down so that so that no one will shoot you. They both looked out from behind. Around the corner, but nothing happened. The waiting was getting tiresome. Herbert thought that the thugs might well have jumped through the window and escaped. Good riddance, as they say. By the way, had he locked the safe, he could have left the door open when he left the room. Yeah, if the thugs just left, that's one thing. But if they took the money, the newspaperman would tear him to shreds, and his own people, his own people will offer him resignation, especially if they find out the judge agreed to work with a cop behind everybody's back. But it's not a crime to agree to play. It's losing. How did he agree to this scam? They say the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Herbert hated himself, literally despised himself. But the detective felt the same way. An experienced policeman, how could he have missed two robbers, especially if he'd been waiting in ambush for them? Your Honor, Felix whispered, bringing his phone to the judge's face. Is that for you? The message on the screen. Well, what does it say? Herbert, she's not here. Call me back, I'm worried. What does that mean? Asked the detective. It means she's back, sighed the judge. Laura, my daughter. Also, I think I know who's been sneaking into the guest house. Mike saw a light on in some building. With the mansion out of the picture, this structure could very well be called a house. Everything was in place. Chimney, veranda, rug, and other attributes of cottages. Only the cottage was smaller, wasn't it? The judge must have gone there. He's resting, hiding. We should take a look around. Mike walked up to the cottage and began to look in every window. There was a faint light burning in one, wavering. It's like a candle being lit, thought the thug. He pressed himself close to the glass, and no. So the judge hadn't lied about the mistress. The fogged glass didn't give him a good look at what was inside. But the long white hair left no doubt. A woman. Mike's brain immediately shut down. Lying in the warm bathtub, Laura stared at the tablet screen. She had tapped into the security cameras and was waiting for her lover. Someone had turned them off an hour ago, but she had turned them back on. She liked watching the property at night, but now, looking at the safe footage, there was definitely some movement on the screen. She stared at the dark figure, switching between cameras. Someone's running with a stick of some kind. No, a rifle. Five minutes ago, a strange sound broke the silence of the night. It sounded like thunder or an engine slamming. Maybe one of the neighbors was celebrating a wedding and decided to set off fireworks. The cameras on the property were good, but not good enough. And then she saw it, a flash. Lo and behold, there was a dork standing on the bathroom doorstep. Laura sat up in surprise, covering her chest with her hand. Who are you? She asked, frightened. And what are you doing here? 
I'll call the police. Well, well. She began frantically tapping on the tablet screen. She was terrified and forgot what the police number was. 119, or was it 991? Suddenly her fingers were no longer obeying her. She felt paralyzed. She'd never felt anything like this before. Yeah, the police, the man smiled, and the girl saw his horrible black teeth. Call the fire department. She was paralyzed with fear. So when the stranger came close to her and slapped her cheek with all his might, she couldn't even resist. He snatched the tablet from her hands and threw it into the water. That's where her dad's birthday present, a brand new iPhone, went. So, how do you call the police now? Asked the dog. No, answered Laura. Why? Why did you hit me? Turn away, please. I want to get dressed, said the girl and suddenly cried. She started to rise, but the stranger grabbed her by the shoulder and sharply put her back down. With force, he removed the hands with which she was covering her breasts, and on his face she saw an expression that frightened her for real. She was suddenly very, very cold. A shiver ran down her body. You're such a sweetie, he said, smacking his lips. You've never even known a normal man, have you? Nothing. Now I'll tell you everything and show you. And with these words, to the girl's horror, he began to take off his clothes. Jacket, sweater, socks, jeans. Then she covered her eyes with her hands and saw nothing. Only smelled the nauseating odor of a man's body dirty and neglected. From the way the water level in the bathtub rose sharply, she realized he had just sat down next to her. She wanted to scream to call for help, but out of terror, she couldn't even open her mouth. He grabbed her arms and pulled them away. Put her in the water, gently stroked her shoulder. The way a cat plays with a mouse never kills it immediately. The girl felt the blood drain from her face. The bathroom around began to spin, and in the center was the black smile of the hubby who had just broken in. Pete, nicknamed Dirty, opened the back door without much trouble and stepped out into the night. People live. The air here in the suburbs was wonderful. His soul was warmed by several hundred thousand dollars, which he put in his backpack. The main thing now was to get to the car, start the engine, and drive away. I could, of course, go back, burn the hell out of this house, but it wasn't worth the risk. Pete ran to the high fence and climbed over it without much difficulty. Oh, how many fences he'd had in his life. How many locks? Well, it's all right to take a break now. We'll have to go away somewhere. Not forever for a while. He could even get himself a new identity. A hundred grand and he'll have a clean passport. But he won't go far. He'll watch the judge from afar. And he's bound to come up with a new plan to get close to this man. He'll probably install new locks. He'll buy another safe, bigger than the last one. Hire a guard or two. No matter what he comes up with, Pete will always be one step ahead. He's a professional, as unassuming and unstoppable as fate itself. There's no other way around it. Frankie, of course, is a pity, a driver and mechanic from God, a great helper and in general. Mike is such a buddy, he is too aggressive, and Pete was starting to be afraid of him. The leader peeked out from behind the trees, looked around, clear. This is Pontiac waiting for him. It's a reliable car, no doubt about it. He left the keys right in the lock. Who would steal a car in this expensive neighborhood? It's a nice car, but it uses a lot of gas. Too bad he'll have to dump it, but that's his lot. A real thief can't have anything permanent. No apartments, no women, no cars. Pete opened the door and took the bag off his shoulder but then someone slapped him across the face with all his might. He fell backwards, the bag fell to the ground, and once of dollars spilled out of it. The same man roughly turned him face down, put his hands behind his back, and delivered another blow to the back of his head. Pete's eyes starred before his eyes. It can't be. He fought feverishly. It just can't be. That's how Dirty was ignominiously caught red-handed at the scene of the crime. The cop was so proud. 
When the detective and the judge ran up to the guest house, Felix's phone rang again. He reluctantly picked it up. Partner, I got one in, Harry reported, sitting on Pete's back. He wanted to put his knee on Pete's neck, but they'd recently been strictly forbidden to do such a thing, on pain of dismissal and prosecution. Who did you take? Felix was surprised. Dirty, answered his partner. I just arrived, I saw his car, about which you spoke. I got inside, I had such an impulse, that's it. It wasn't a minute later he showed up, sweetheart. Where's he going now? Put him in our salon for now, Felix replied. Just tie his hands and feet carefully, and tie his mouth too, and bullet to us. And don't move, there's cameras everywhere. Listen, Phil, don't hang up. Harry said again. There's a whole bag of bucks here. What are we gonna do with it? Take it with you, Felix said. Go to the guest house. It's like a mansion, only smaller. Over and out. Herbert ran up to the cabin and froze in indecision. What was waiting for him inside? What if he opened the door and there was his daughter's breathless body? He had often interrogated relatives of victims in murder cases. Not a pleasant experience, if you ask me. Or did he take a hostage? Your honor, Felix whispered. Good news. Dirty Pete has been apprehended. Where? The judge was surprised. On the street, answered the detective, my partner. Felix preferred not to talk about the fact that it was a coincidence. After all, luck loves the prepared. Pete was taken on the hot seat. The judge has a couple of bruises on his face. It'll heal. All we got to do is get the other one, and we're good to go. The judge was silent, and the detective preferred not to ask him any questions. Is this Mike so stupid that he's hiding in the guest house? Or maybe he's taking a bath there. Meanwhile, Herbert opened the front door. It wasn't locked either. At least, the detective hadn't seen the judge fiddling with the locks. Where would he go? This man without a robe. What if Strangled was waiting for him there? The detective ran up to Herbert, grabbed his arm and whispered, Stop. There may be an ambush. I'll go first. To his surprise, the judge agreed and nodded. Felix dismissed him and gestured for him to hide behind the wall. Then the detective ducked to the ground, opened the door sharply and rolled forward. From the outside it looked as if the fat cat had suddenly decided to practice catching mice and he was doing a good job. There was no one inside. Holding the gun in front of him, the detective ran on. He heard voices somewhere nearby, very close. A strip of light was shining from under the white door. He went to it, listened. A familiar voice. That's right, it was Mike. The judge ran up behind him, and the detective raised his hand in the air. In special forces, that gesture meant stop. No, why are you breaking, huh? A man's voice questioned. Come on, I'd rather do it with a live one, okay. But I can do it with a dead one, okay, I'm fine. Felix flipped a switch and rushed inside. Herbert followed him in. When the detective and the judge looked at the situation, they saw a terrible picture. From what they saw, the judge clutched at his heart. He sat down on the floor. It became difficult to breathe. The ceiling and walls swam in front of him. In the middle of all this picture sat his daughter, completely white, and her unseeing eyes staring forward. The detective quickly pulled himself together. He ran to the bathroom and shouted, Raise your hands, you. Raise them where I can see them. Felix loved his daughter. She was not just the meaning of life, but life itself. If on one side of the scale put his money, mansion and position, and on the other Laura, he would choose his daughter without hesitation. One day she climbed a tree in the yard, a maple, neither young nor old, and then she snapped, plummeted down from a height of three or even four meters. Luckily, it was all right. She didn't even break anything, but the doctors at the private clinic had a huge bill. The next day, Herbert went to the barn, took the biggest ax he could find and chopped the maple tree down. One day at school, a bully snatched his daughter's backpack out of her hands 
and then stomped on it with his feet. Herbert didn't rest until he got the kid expelled. Although the parents of the guy tried to find a compromise with him, he loved his daughter, but he didn't know how to express his feelings. He bought her expensive things, cell phones, paid for her girlfriends, but it wasn't an expression of love. And he only started to realize that recently, Sylvia was different. She loved sincerely and hated just as much. Herbert never thought his daughter would come back. If he'd known where this whole adventure would lead, he never would have agreed to it. Yes, he'd noticed that Laura was different. Indifferent to money, his prestigious position, and his expensive college. He'd noticed, but he thought she'd grow out of it. She'd get over it. No, really, what more could you want? Living in such a luxurious mansion, traveling to the best resorts. He put $2,000, $2,000 on her card so she could participate in the sales. Go out, have fun, do whatever you want. But for some reason, she ran away and sneaked into his house. And she did it so quietly that Felix didn't even notice. And now, looking into the glass eyes of his daughter, the judge was prepared for the worst. Pictures of their life together flashed before him. Here he was picking up a tiny envelope from the maternity hospital. Here they were arguing with Sylvia over a name. Then Herbert suggested they write their choices on slips of paper and let the baby choose. And Laura's little hand chose the one with his name on it, probably because the other one had the same thing written on it. Here he was taking her to kindergarten. Expensive, private, but still. He had a school, first trip to the movies, first field trip. Tibut in the school theater. Now Herbert looked into the glass eyes and could not believe that everything was over. The thug sat next to him and smiled. He was definitely amused. The judge wanted to empty the entire magazine of his rifle into him, pointed the barrel right in the villain's face. He kept laughing. Then he turned his gaze to Laura and, oh, miracle, she blinked. His daughter seemed fine to him, as much as possible in a situation like this. A stuffy Mike sat in the bathroom smiling with his hideous black teeth. One of his dirty hands rested on Laura's shoulder and the other on the rim of the luxurious tub. In it he held a gun. As he shifted his gaze from Felix to Herbert, he did not utter a word, nor did he react in any way to the judge's huge gun. Raise your hands, I said. The detective demanded. Well, or what? Asked the thug. Will you shoot me? Yes, nodded Felix. I'll blow your brains out. No, you won't do that. Mike shook his head. That's not who you are. You're a goose. You're a goose. You're a goose. You can't do anything. Get out. Mike, it's over. Felix repeated. No, smiled the robber. I'm fine here with a chick like that. Laura woke up. She looked at her tormentor, and without a word, she elbowed him right in the eye. Mike roared in pain and started to raise his gun hand. But the detective's lightning-fast reaction didn't fail him. In a split second, he was near the thug and knocked the gun out of his hand. Laura threw another blow, then another and another. Mike himself flew out of the tub. But no, chick. He screamed. You could have just said you didn't like me. Not this. Felix made a slip. Mike collapsed to the tiled floor. He laughed as the detective cuffed him behind his back. Dark water dripped off his filthy body. It felt like he'd never washed at all. In a minute, he had a huge puddle of water in which he was floundering like a fish, and he kept laughing. What a night, Mike said. Something to remember in the cell. Get that garbage out of here, Herbert said and walked over to his daughter. Laura, are you all right? But his daughter was silent. She was crying, smearing tears on her cheeks. It's okay, she's a strong girl, the judge thought. She'll get through this. And indeed, Laura sobbed for only a few minutes. Then she wiped away her tears, looked at her father and begged. Daddy, come out of here. I want to wash this filth off me and get dressed. Did he do something to you? Herbert asked. No, she answered. He came in a couple minutes before you. Thank God, 
whispered the judge and carefully closed the door behind him. The detective put Mike on the floor. Herbert tossed the criminal's belongings next to him. Felix put on his pants, boots, and T-shirt and sweater without removing the handcuffs. But he didn't bother to take his underwear and socks. Now the bandit looked ridiculous. Are we going according to plan? The detective asked, looking at the judge. He was silent for a second, then nodded. Yes, replied Herbert. I'll take my daughter now, and we'll start formalizing them. Whatever you say, Felix agreed. Hey, put your socks on, Mike demanded with a smile. My heels are freezing. You'll get over it, the detective spat. He was used to detainees behaving nastily, so the criminal's words did not resonate with him. Returning to his daughter, the judge saw her surprisingly collected and calm, or just detached. She had drained the bathtub, and now her gadgets lay in the fragrant lather. The judge took them out, pressed the buttons. It works. Wow, he hadn't paid that kind of money for nothing. Herbert looked into his daughter's eyes and said, It's no trouble, Laura, that these have sunk. I'll buy you new ones. Go ahead, order them right now. Okay, she muttered. Do you want anything? Shall I make you some tea or heat up some milk? Just take me to my room, Daddy. They walked through the property, and the landscaping now seemed annoying to him. Why does he spend so much time on the picture? Far more important is what's inside. If you want justice, be prepared for someone to get hurt. Justice, like beauty, requires sacrifice. Forgive me, Herbert asked. I'm sorry. I didn't know you were back. But Laura was silent. They went up to the second floor and entered her bedroom. There was still the faint odor of gunpowder in the air. Herbert's pajamas, dirty and torn in several places, smelled of it, too. He only now noticed that his house slippers were on his feet. Now they were ready to go in the trash. Daughter, why don't you say anything? The judge asked. But Laura said nothing. Just lay down in bed, put her head on the pillow, and pulled up the blanket. Herbert sighed. Nothing. He would hire the best psychologists. They will work with her and will definitely help. She's a strong girl. She'll get over it. In a month or so, she'll forget this scoundrel. Stu suddenly thought Herbert, and he felt sick. Poor Stu. The judge went back to his room and went into the bathroom. He picked up a washcloth, turned on the water, and began scrubbing the blood off his face. Then he took out his first aid kit and treated the wounds. It's okay, scars only beautify a judge. After all, they weren't done yet. We need to focus, concentrate. Justice will not restore itself. Then Herbert took off his pajamas and threw them in the washing machine, poured in the powder and turned it on, took out a white shirt pants. At first he wanted to put on a tie, but then he changed his mind. When the police and those vulture journalists get here, you have to look good. But that'll be later. The scoundrels are well guarded, and there's no hurry. Another hour won't solve anything, not even a little. The judge returned to the guest house. Felix continued to sit beside Mike. He wasn't laughing anymore. Harry was marking something in his notebook. That's the old school, writing everything down. How does he make sense of his scribbles? The detectives looked at Herbert. Felix sighed. He must have felt guilty, and he was right. How is she? The fool cop asked. She's having a nervous breakdown, Harry said. Took her into the bedroom, put her to bed, asked me not to call an ambulance. I think we should see this through to the end. That's good, Felix replied, because I'm really determined to get to work. It's like a dream come true. Shouldn't we call for backup, too? Harry asked. No, Felix said. What's the point? We've already held them off. I think it makes sense to stick to the plan. As soon as we leave, the judge will call in a task force. Have them get a proper record of the whole thing. Whatever you say, boss, Harry nodded. But I've already made my point. The detectives looked at the judge. Only now did they notice that he had changed his clothes. Hardy. I'll give you that. 
Bring the other one here, Herbert ordered. It was time to finish. When Harry brought Pete in and seated him beside his accomplice, Mike's face was twisted with anger. The detective placed the bag of bucks next to him. After the bath, the thug smelled like some kind of delicate skincare product. Pete's gaze was cloudy Harry was punching well. Even now, the robber thought he could get away. He could get away with it. So that's what you are, Mike hissed, glaring at his partner in crime. You decided to get away without me, with the money, you rat. Hey, calm down, Pete shouted, calm down. I was coming for you, if anything. Who's the third guy? Mike asked. Who is he? Who's the third? Pete was surprised. Frankie's in jail, remember? I saw a guy walking through the precinct, Mike said. And the judge took him down. He did. And now. When Felix heard this conversation, he turned around. Harry raised an eyebrow in bewilderment. The older man made a gesture that only they could understand. The detective's partner could only sigh. Well, the door opened, and the judge entered the room. He had dressed his wounds with green, and now he looked strange. You've had enough, boys, said the justice of the peace. I warned you. I even asked you. Go fuck yourself, Mike hissed. You've already ruined my life. It's definitely them, Herbert said. They confessed everything in the bedroom. What are you going to tell them, Felix? The huge cop smiled, showing his white teeth. It must be the smile of the lion preparing to swallow its prey. He looked at Mike and Pete carefully and began his story. You think Frankie didn't say anything? Hell no. He told me right off that it was you two scoundrels who'd set the whole thing up. But he didn't want to say anything on the record. He was scared shitless. I needed proof. I wanted to nail you both to the wall. Why? Pete asked. Couldn't sleep at night? I was watching you, Felix smiled again. And when I found out you were sleeping with Barbara, I knew right away that you were digging for the judge. No, Pete shook his head. Coincidence. But things didn't go quite as I planned, the detective sighed, and there was a sadness in his eyes. You showed up here a day later than I expected. Passed me by. And you've had terrible luck. But he who laughs last laughs well. Night Road. How many times had he, Pete, driven like this? Police cars have bars separating the back seat from the front. And the windows, too. And here he was again, watching the world go by. It's okay. He'll be out soon. In his thoughts, the robot even started to fall asleep. Hey, Mike yelled. Chief, the lot's the other way. You went around the corner. Who said we were going to the station? The fat cop smiled, turning in his chair. You got away. You even made it to the woods. Yeah, his partner echoed him. To the edge of the woods. Did you read the headlines this morning? You tried to escape, didn't you? But you didn't get far. The judge went into his daughter's room. She was awake, just lying there. She's got the same tablet that's not afraid of water. Yeah, that's some rugged tech. They should be launching rockets into space. Stu, she whispered, sobbing. Stu, I'm sorry, sweetheart, replied the judge, holding his daughter to his chest. Those subhumans, those scumbags shot him. I'm really sorry and I don't know how I can live with that. Daddy, Laura whispered, clinging to his chest. Daddy, I saw everything. You saw what? The judge asked in a cold voice. Everything, she answered. I saw the footage from the cameras. You're the one who turned them off. Thank you for watching this video to the end. Subscribe to the channel. Like it, write comments if you like the story. And see you on the channel.